Hello, everyone. Uh, so yes, my the topic of my uh, talk today is about breastfeeding when a baby has additional needs. And it is basically just my very personal journey through uh, NICU and, uh, and how we got uh, my third baby to, to breastfeed. Where am I? What am I clicking to? Just this one? Okay. Okay, so I'm here to talk about Tessa. She was my third baby. She was born in 2013 with an extremely rare condition called Bosma Arrhenia Micropathalmia Syndrome, or BAM Syndrome for short. Basically, she was born without a nose. We were expecting a perfectly healthy baby, so her birth was a huge shock and absolutely terrifying. We were separated almost immediately and she was taken to NICU with clear instruction that only human donor milk be given until I could provide it myself. The separation was excruciating. Empty and alone, I cried myself to sleep that night. I was scared, in shock and grieving. And then came the devastating realization that I wouldn't be able to breastfeed my baby. I was already training to be a La Leche League counselor and I was still nursing my two-year-old, so there had been no doubt that I would feed this baby too, but now that looked impossible. The pain of thinking I'd never get to feed her myself was unbearable. This is what Tessa looked like whenever I got to see her again. NICU was incredibly stressful and upsetting. Far from maternal contact being encouraged, it was actively discouraged, with minimal handling recommended actually written in my baby's notes. They believed moving or holding my newborn daughter would cause her to bring up more milk. I believed that not being held by her mother was inherently stressful to my baby, and that lying alone in a box with tubes down her throat, being fed large amounts of milk three hourly, had something to do with her not tolerating her feeds. The expectation was that I would go home once discharged and make the two hour round trip every few days to drop off pumped milk and otherwise stay out of the way but I simply couldn't leave the hospital while my baby was there. So I cried and begged whoever would listen until I was begrudgingly allowed to sleep in one of the three family rooms, although I was asked to leave almost every day. Now, when Tessa was eight days old, she was transferred to Children's Hospital to have a tracheostomy placed as a second airway. And as utterly terrifying as the prospect of someone cutting a hole in my baby's neck was, it had given me hope that with a second airway, breastfeeding might be possible. Unsurprisingly though, there was no hospital handout on breastfeeding a baby with a tracheostomy, and even information on the internet was hard to come by. After the operation, Tessa was cared for in paediatric ICU for a week. In stark contrast to NICU, I was handed my baby straight away and was free to hold her for as long and as often as I wanted, which was all the time, and no one ever asked me to leave. Two days later, when Tessa was 10 days old, I was allowed to try her at the breast. It was scary and awkward, and I kept thinking I would hurt her because of her trachea, but she actually latched and we had our first breastfeed. It felt incredible. We had a few successful feeds before being transferred back to NICU despite begging to be allowed to stay in Children's Hospital, despite Tessa being completely stable and breathing room air, hospital policy meant that we were going back to NICU, whether we liked it or not. They actually put Tessa back in an incubator and I practically had to have a meltdown to get her out. They finally agreed and wheeled an open cot in. Instead of deciding to make an exception due to unique circumstances and let my baby go to special care, they put a cot in NICU and for three weeks we took up an expensive life-saving spot with a medically healthy baby. Now when it came to feeding things were not going well. Tessa was being fed by an orogastric tube, she was bringing up a lot of her milk and her weight gain was low but trying to get breastfeeding established in NICU proved impossible. I wasn't allowed to even try without an assessment from speech and language therapy, despite already having had those successful feeds back in children's. I wasn't allowed to remove the orogastic tube that was taped to, her, taped to her mouth to help her latch. And I only had an upright hard chair in which to try in. I wasn't allowed adequate time. And if I wanted privacy, someone had to leave the ward and wheel in an antique curtain rail like something from World War II. Leaving NICU to get and return this curtain meant the rigorous hand washing when you re-entered. So despite assurances that it was no problem, it was time consuming. And so when staff were busy, I didn't ask. 
I wasn't allowed to feed her more frequently or while holding her upright to help her keep her milk down because it wasn't hospital policy. Instead, her consultants wanted to add thickener to her feeds and give her overnight pump feeds, and I refused, much to their disapproval. Eventually, due to immense... Oh, sorry, I'm going to go back. Eventually, due to immense pressure and lack of breastfeeding support, I decided to focus on getting her weight up with the tube feeds. I kept asking until somebody finally said yes to two hourly feeds and upright feeding. It worked and her weight gain increased, but they wouldn't discharge us on two hourly feeds because two hourly feeds aren't sustainable no matter how good a mother you are. Breastfeeding, breastfeeding in NICU was just not a priority. Breast milk and pumping were absolutely encouraged, but with most mums completely absent, even that had next to no practical support. Whether babies made the transition to the breast or mum maintained her supply was seemingly up to fate and not something, and not seen as something that could almost always be achieved with qualified, dedicated in-person support. Now, some of the staff were exceptional and one or two went above and beyond for me and my baby and I'll be forever grateful. Others, however, through their words and actions, made my time there more difficult. I never felt that getting my baby to the breast was valued as something anyone should be spending time or effort achieving. I was made to feel like an inconvenience. I was told that my inability to leave my baby meant that I wasn't coping. I was told that I needed to think of my other children. I was told Tessa didn't even know I was there. I was constantly asked to leave. I was lied to about the availability of accommodation and told that my milk wasn't enough without fortifier, high calorie formula or thickener and I was made to feel stupid and obstinate for refusing those things. I watched as babies cried alone in their incubators, their tiny arms and legs flailing silently behind the plastic and I had nightmares that Tessa was being left to cry when I wasn't there with her. I witnessed mistakes including fortifier being given without my knowledge or consent the wrong feeding information being given to anesthesiology and the wrong birth weights being copied down. I was isolated, lonely and only allowed one visitor. My other children weren't allowed to meet their new sister. There was no one looking after me. Now I was lucky enough to have a Lech League leader and friend Carl Smith there when I finally got home after five weeks in hospital. After less than a week struggling with tube feeds, tracky care and expressing, one night Tessa threw up her tube and I didn't replace it. With my confidence slowly recovering, I was determined to get her to breastfeed and eventually got her latched. Over the next few days, we found that she could take a bottle easier as a few of her reflexes weren't quite kicking in. Firstly, she had no hunger cues because she'd been on regular scheduled feeds for so long. And secondly, she wouldn't latch or swallow until she felt pressure on her soft palate. It was much easier to get a bottle into her mouth without her cooperation, so most of her feeds were from the bottle for the next two weeks. Carl had suggested that Tessa's lack of smell could be part of the problem, as she would root like crazy but seem, seem inca incapable of knowing where and how to latch without help. I was stubborn though and well supported, and with Carl's help we began to phase out the bottles. There were many tears from both of us, and I felt like I needed three hands but eventually a combination of motion where I would walk and bounce her sometimes using a sling, a bait and switch technique where I would start to get her suckling on a bottle or dummy in the crook of my arm and then try and switch it over to my breast as smoothly as possible and using an exaggerated latch technique to get as deep a latch as possible to trigger her suck response. We finally started to get some success. It was a steep and often painful learning curve and extremely emotionally difficult as it feels like repeated rejections when your baby is crying for a bottle and not you. Despite everything, and thanks to a lot of belief and perseverance, by eight weeks old, Tessa was exclusively breastfed. She stayed on the last centile for weight, which seemed to stress her dietitian out, but she gained and grew steadily and is still on that line eight, six years later. She nursed with her older sister for two and a half years and shared with her little brother for two and a half only stopping a few months before her sixth birthday. She nursed through 12 operations and all the usual common illnesses, through a myriad of childhood bumps, scrapes, milestones, 
cut knees, chicken pox, and surgery. Breastfeeding provided comfort, nutrition, and immune support at every stage. It was our haven, our safe space, at home or in hospital, and was absolutely worth every tear and all the days and hours of effort that it took to get started. Now, my story may be unique in its particulars, but its themes are all too common. We know from our rates that breastfeeding is not adequately valued or supported when things are straightforward, and unfortunately that lack of support is even more pronounced when specialised help is required. There are many things that could have been done to support me and my baby to breastfeed during our time in hospital. And while I was extremely in, a, in an extremely privileged position to have both a great deal of personal experience, but also expert guidance of a Lelech League leader at my fingertips, not many others are as lucky. They will simply believe that breastfeeding was never possible for them. Babies with complex and additional needs like Tessa and many others may need extra support and time to get breastfeeding established, but these babies have the most to gain. Many will be at higher risk of illness and infection, which breastfeeding can go some way to mitigating. Some may be facing fre frequent procedures and operations where breastfeeding can ease pain, aid healing, reduce rates of post-operative infection, and then there's the psychological and emotional side of breastfeeding for both mum and baby. Special needs and NICU mums, like me, are higher risk of PTSD, anxiety disorders, and depression. In a time where we are rightly fo putting more focus on maternal mental health, we need our healthcare system to recognize breastfeeding as the very foundation of emotional and mental well-being. Breastfeeding isn't something that just happens between a mother's breast and her baby's tummy. It is something that affects our brains profoundly too. I know how much, how important it was for me personally and how psychologically healing and experience feeding my baby was. I was able to benefit from the incredible array of hormones that are produced during breastfeeding. Hormones that support bonding, so much more important after separation. Hormones that aid sleep, helping to reduce anxiety and just insomnia. Hormones that inhibit the stress hormones, the mainstay of any special needs parent. Hormones that encourage relaxation, that boost feelings of love and the ability to feel loved. In summary, breastfeeding can make a huge difference to the lives of vulnerable babies and families like mine. It needs to be invested in and prioritized because all families deserve to experience the same physical, mental and emotional healing that we got from our breastfeeding journey.